everyone. Welcome to this episode of Understanding People brought to you by Get Abstract. My name is Kristen Miller Dauberman. And throughout this series, we have been looking at ways to use all of the change and uncertainty that has happened in both our professionals and our personal lives as a result of the pandemic, how we can use that as an opportunity for growth. And of course, understanding ourselves better, our work colleagues, our family and friends, so that we can all really build a foundation from which we can look toward the future with optimism. Um, and today we are talking about really one of the most foundational concepts. And, and actually, I'm very glad to be ending this series talking about this topic, and that is how to manage change. And with me is a change expert. Uh, he's joining us, Campbell McPherson. Um, and I'll just introduce him to you briefly before we dive into our conversation. So uh, Campbell is an international business advisor. He's a keynote speaker, an executive coach, um, as well as a workshop facilitator, an author, and a change catalyst. He is also an executive fellow at Henley Business School. He has a wealth of experience across a variety of interest industries with a particular emphasis on financial services. His first book, The Change Catalyst, won the Business Book of the Year Award in the UK in 2018. And his second book, The Power to Change, has just been shortlisted for the 2021 awards. It's featured in our Get Abstract Library, and it's what we're gonna be talking about today. So Campbell, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here, Kirsten. Yeah. So humans are having a difficult time keeping up with the pace of change. And already, even before the pandemic, life was accelerating in the technology mm. sphere, in the work sphere, in the political sphere, social sphere. Why are humans just seemingly by nature not so great at navigating change? Well, I think you've, you've uh, answered the question with, within your question. It is by nature. It's a bit of an evolutionary throwback that, that we instantly uh, put up barriers, barriers to change. And, uh, and then those barriers can, some of those barriers can last a few seconds, but others can actually last a lifetime. So we, it's, it's part of our human nature to react to, to all changes personal, even the, the largest organizational changes is actually the, the culmination of a myriad of personal individual changes. And, and we all uh, erect our own personal barriers to change. The trick is to identify what are the barriers you erect when change happens to you, or even when you instigate change as well, you'll still uh, put some friction in front of you. But work out which barriers you erect and then work on ways to actually overcome them. Yeah. So what are some of the biggest things creating change in our society? Let's talk about external change first. Sure. Well, in the uh, in the book, that's the, the first uh, part section of the book that I that I talked through. So I talked through the all of the incredible changes that we've been through in the last you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years um, and the changes that are that are to come. So obviously, we talk about the Internet and how that has changed our lives. The Internet of Things is about to change uh, yeah. our, our lives. Um, the fact that we're living so much longer, 120 years ago, the average age expectancy was lucky to be 40 and now it's double that uh, throughout the world and even more if you happen to be uh, wealthy and live in a, in a, in a Western society. Um, we talk about climate change, which I, I talk, uh, I describe as the dangerous power of denial, which is one of the barriers that we erect to change and, and the fact uh, and the environment, of, of course. So there's so many external uh, things that are happening. And actually an interesting part is when, when I wrote the book, We'd put it all to bed. And of course, we put it all to bed by January 2020. And yeah. in February, <laughs> I rang up Coke and Page and said, hold the press. Yeah. We've missed the biggest change in the last century. We're not even mentioning it in the book. So so we, uh, we ended up putting a preface about, about the virus that changed our world and, and, uh, and then changed several bits of the book to be talk, just mentioned in COVID. Can you imagine launching a book on how to embrace personal change <laughs> when you don't even mention the largest personal change we've all uh, experienced? 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and social change too, actually something that's been uh, being talked about more and more is, is population decline in Western countries and how that's going to change the fabric of societies. Also how companies yeah, and point. businesses um, respond to that. And I just thought of it because you mentioned people living longer um, and kind of that pyramid of, of welfare um, being inverted almost and how what role companies and organizations are going to have to play in that. Um, I want to get your input on how big of an issue that this actually is, especially for businesses. Um, I know that, you know, consulting companies every year, you know, put out studies that talk about the, the sure. impact in dollars um, and what percentage of change does or doesn't happen as a result of people not embracing this. What, what have you seen in your work, especially as a coach? Well, one of the great statistics that I used that was the hook to the first book, actually, was a, a study in, by Bain and Co. Uh, back in 2016 that, that said that 88% of change initiatives fail. And when I saw that, I thought, what? And I looked into it in, in greater depth. And, and it felt right for me. And it, the, the st study, they said 88% of change initiatives fail to deliver what they set out to achieve. So I thought, why? And so I instantly researched and looked back at my own experience about what are the top 10 reasons why organizational change fails. And that, that was the first 10 chapters of the first book. <laughs> and then the second 10 chapters were, well, what are we going to do about that? What are the essential ingredients to successful change? But in, in the first book, the top number one reason was, was exactly where you started here is that, is that people don't like change. We, we always put up change barriers. So when I started to do uh, lectures on, on the power to change and run leading change workshops for Henley and for, for organizations, everyone wanted to delve into that part of how to help our people to want to change more deeply, mm. because that's how I now define leadership. Leadership, yes, it's about clarity. It's about why we're, we're heading in a certain direction. It's about getting a purpose and why do we deserve to be successful and all of those things. But fundamentally, it boils down to one little pithy line, which is how do I help my people to want to change? So I think what's happened over the last 12 months is that companies have realized that change isn't a project. Change is, is not something that, that we just have to sit and wait for it to, to pass us by or to be over. Change is a part of life. Uncertainty is now um, hardwired into business as it is hardwired into life. So we all have no option but just to accept either the good change or bad change, but accept both of them. And so that's what the book is about, is, is making the emotions that we all experience in times of change to be normal, to normalize mm -hmm. that and to then start to work on, on ways that we can learn to accept, accept uncertainty, thrive during uncertainty, and of course, embracing change, embrace change. Can you talk about the four types of change that you identify in the book? And then... I'd like to ask, when is it right for an organization to pursue bringing on an external change manager? Because that's always okay. the tricky point, you know, like, oh, when it is really it too much is. that we that's need a, someone from outside? That is a great question. Yes, I'm, what, what, I, what I did when I, just before I did the first uh, leading change workshop at, at Henley, um, for for all of their clients, um, it, it was it was a great day. Before that, I thought I'm missing something in, in the work that, I, that I'm doing, missing something in the first book. So I sat down and I drew a change matrix and it was really quite simple. And on the, on the y-axis is the size of the change from big to small. Of course, it's, it's not binary, there's, there's shades of gray there. But on the x-axis is where the magic happens. And the x-axis is, is the degree of personal control that we actually have over the change. Mm -hmm. So from none, it's all being done to me, to I'm in complete control of this change. So if you can imagine in your head a, a wonderful consultants two by two, uh, this matrix, when I put it together, I thought this is going to be so embarrassingly simple. It'll, no one will ever use it. I'll, I'll never show it to anyone. And yet it really works and its beauty lies in its simplicity. The, the bottom two quadrants of when the change is small, of even if it's change that is forced upon us like the HR department has a new form that we have to fill in or, or change that we instigate that's small. We just get on with that. It's, it's, it's not life or death. We get on with it. It's the top two quadrants that are the really important ones. So it's big change, but it's big change when it's done to us, which I call the burning platform quadrant after uh, Daryl Connor's um, um, burning platform comment 20 odd years ago as he saw people leap from a burning oil rig yeah. into the North Sea, a burning platform for change. That's big change 
that's done to us. And we undergo an emotional roller coaster uh, during that time. But the other quadrant nobody talks about, and that's that's the emotional roller coaster we experience when we instigate big change. And as you will know, you you know, Kirsten, you've gone through some some big change change recently. You go through the roller coaster of emotions. You start with excitement. You can then get to a bit of uh, um, wondering what the dickens have I have I done here. There's some <laughs> doubt that creeps in before you actually go through what a, a different version of the change curve and, and come out the other end. So it's big change that's done to us and big change we instigate. What I what I help people to do, what I help leaders to do, is is to understand that these emotions is what exactly what their people are going through, because they go through them themselves. The leaders go through them themselves. So just by being aware that, hang on, um, my people go through the same emotions I do, uh, suddenly without telling them to be empathetic, they're being empathetic. So th th they're the four different types types of change. But your question about that I've completely forgotten now about <laughs> what, what about when, when, yeah, when, when to oh, when to bring someone, someone from external, in as a change yeah, manager, yeah. I think I would not bring anyone in as a change manager. I would bring someone in to help the leadership team build the ability to lead change. So yeah. they've got lots of project managers in 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 house. Um, it's the leadership team that needs to lead this. But I've found, and I started my change journey, if you like, 25 years ago with Anderson Consulting in their change division. And what they did is they swamp uh, customers with, 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 um, with consultants. And that's not the way to do it. It's, to, it's someone to help the leaders to lead change and to build a culture that embraces change, uh, which obviously is, is, is what I do. But I, I, don't, I don't think you need project managers and change managers. You just need um, coaches, mentors, and, and and help to actually do it yourself. So you know, it's, you've got to help your people to want to change. By doing that, you just need to be able to have the skills uh, and the, the, the attitude and mindset and tools to be able to lead them to change. So to me, it's about change leadership and embracing change. They're the two, they're the two key things, frankly, for, for any business. You've talked a few times about those internal barriers to change. Um, and, you know, that seems to involve quite a lot of, of self-reflection, intellectual yeah. humility. Um, what are some of, just a few, because you talk about a lot, but what are some of the most common unconscious barriers that people, whether they're leaders or, or, or not, might have to change? Well, it's it, it's all wrapped up in the the change curve that we we all experience, and one one of the key things is uh, one of the key emotions we feel is fear, uh, and it's it's there's a, a bunch of fears, a different uh, types of fears that come to the fore, particularly in business when we're confronted by big change that is that is forced upon us. The fear of failure is the big one, um, and also also a fear of the unknown is a, is is another one, and what I also call the fear of being blamed. So just quickly talk about those three fear of failure. We all talk about when I run my workshops, I say, what's, you know, what's, what's, what are the biggest barriers to change and fear of failure comes out number one, every single time. Now, one of the ways of that, that I recommend of, of, of people to overcome a fear of failure is sort of three things really. One, one is to, to put it in perspective. I know the old adage of if you're if you're afraid of of uh, public speaking, imagine everybody naked. I don't think that quite works, but at least put it in perspective. Mm. Um, and you know what? If it did go wrong, so what? What are the consequences? You know, so at least calm yourself down with with that. The other thing is not to set such a high barrier. Set yourself up to succeed rather than set yourself up up to fail. I gave, a, I gave a speech at the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds many years ago, and I set myself up to fail inside my head because my speech not only had to be the best speech I'd ever given, it had to be the best speech they'd ever heard. And it's like, that's impossible. You had the, yeah. the chairman of Goldman Sachs, you had the chair. It's like they, they've heard speeches from everyone around the world. Don't, what are you doing? So when I finished my speech, I, I sat down and my head was in my hands and the organizer said, what's wrong with you, Campbell? And I went, that was the worst speech I've ever given. It wasn't. And, and she said, I know you can do better, but look behind you. 
you've got it. And there was a line of people wanting to sign the book going, oh, I really like yeah. that comment about Disraeli. And so I set myself up to fail in between my ears only. It was madness. Anyway, so so chunk it and also to chunk the, the failure, if you like, or what you need to do, chunk it down into small steps so that if you do have a, it's not failure, it's a glitch or it's a small stumble, then that's fine. You can stumble and go, oh, that didn't quite work. So, so chunk it down into some small steps. Um, and, the, and the other two, as I, as I said, a fear of the unknown, which is try and make as much familiar as you can about what, where, where you're going. So do some research. And fear of being blamed is really interesting. So if you have been doing certain things a certain way for, for a long time and someone comes in and says, we need to change the way this works, which happens in business all the time, instantly the person who has been doing it that way for a long time will be afraid of being blamed for not changing earlier mm -hmm. and they will dig in often they'll dig in too thinking they they love this company they really love what they're doing they're doing the best thing by the business they're not trying to be bad they're just digging in to say but i know how this should be done so it's it's trying to help them to be able to be part of the solution and not part of the problem and if you find yourself that you're the one that is instantly wondering if you're going to be blamed and, and you're the stickler then again open seek to understand engage with 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 uh, uh with with the new ways and find ways to compromise because maybe you don't have all the answers and you could actually improve incrementally what it is that that you've been doing mm, yeah really really great advice um coming up to our last couple of questions sure. one we've been talking so much about change but <laughs> how does a leader lead a change well, and also identify the areas that need to stay foundational or essential or core to the business. Because I imagine, you know, everything can't change. There have to be some things, foundational values people can hold on to. Kirsten, you, you've you got hold of something there that, that, that I spend quite a bit of time on in, in the leading change workshops, uh, in that it's not, it's, it's crucial that, that leaders, if they want change to be successful, are very clear on what needs to be achieved and why, and that makes sense, but not just the, the numbers, but the narrative of what needs to be achieved and not just the logic, but emotions of, of, of why things need to be achieved because emotions trump logic every time when it comes to change. In fact, they're, they're four times more powerful. But, but then I delve down into the next level and I say, You've got to also understand what is the purpose. So you've got to be very clear on why you exist and for whom, um, what, what gives you the right to be successful and what makes you special. But then the second thing is what you're talking about there is what's the magic that you need to retain? And that's how I, how I tried to describe it to them. So not everything about what you're doing now is wrong. In fact, there's if you identify the purpose of your organization or your team or your or department and you know what makes you special, that's the magic you need to hold on to. So the, 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 the best way, really the only way to do that is to do all of that work with your people so that they can identify the magic they can identify and the magic will always be customer centric you know what is the magic we deliver for our customers so if leaders do this in a closed room and i've seen this before and then present it all to their people here's the magic here's our purpose here's it, it falls flat yeah, but if yeah. they engage their people in developing it then everyone is suddenly really excited about the magic we're going to retain and we're going to incrementally improve and build upon that magic for our customers and, and for our people and you can you can sense by my voice there's a sense of excitement and emotion yeah. that, that that goes into that yeah yeah super yeah thank you for explaining that i think that's always important it's that balance and getting those yeah, it's, exactly. it's a part of getting the people on board to help them to want and if you just say everything you've been about. doing in the past is rubbish everything in the future is great <laughs> well a like, it's not true and b it's not exactly motivational <laughs> yeah exactly um last question for you campbell is and it's one that I've asked every guest this whole season, and that is, what are you looking forward to? Or what are you optimistic about for this year, for 2021? Goodness me, I'm optimistic about so many things, I, I, I must admit. Um, I'm optimistic that, that the world might actually start to come together, although I see no signs in that happening at the moment. <laughs> I'm optimistic um, where I where I live is, is the UK. I'm optimistic that I think the UK is, 
it can come out of of uh, of the the Brexit shenanigans and the and COVID uh, on a solid footing. I think it's lost the war, if you like, over the last year. But I think the UK and the US might be able to win. Wrong word, but you know, thrive during the peace. Um, through the vaccinations and through the fact that we're all going to learn to live with the virus. And so I'm, I'm optimistic uh, about that. Um, I'd like to be optimistic about climate change um, and, and let's see what, what starts to happen there. I think the most thing I'm optimistic about is the next generation. I think mm. the, the millennials, or the, you know, people, the, those 35 and, and under have got a sense of, of self-worth and they know what what needs to be done, and and I've got a big sense of optimism around the next generation being able to uh, to to really lead the change uh, over over the next over the next 20, 30 years. Hmm. Well, thank you for filling us with some hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, the book, if you want to read it, is "The Power to Change" um, by, of course, our guest Campbell McPherson. Uh, the abstract is in our Get Abstract library, but of course, buy the book and read the whole thing. It's excellent. <laughs> um, Campbell, thank you again so much for all of the great work that you're doing and for joining us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank all of you for watching. It has been a joy to be with you all throughout the season of understanding people. If there was something here, of course, that you think might be helpful for a friend or a coworker, uh, please share this resource with them. That's why we do what we do so that we can get these incredible tools and this wisdom that our guests have to offer to you and your organization so that we can all grow and be successful this year together. So thank you very much for watching. Um, stay tuned to more incredible releases in our Get Abstract library. Follow us across our social media channels at Get Abstract, and we will see you again very soon. Wishing you a wonderful day. Bye-bye.